Who was that couple we talked about last week that you should investigate and take a look at their life? Aquila and Priscilla, or was it Priscilla and Aquila? Was it Aquila and Priscilla or Priscilla and Aquila? Ah, yeah, six times they're mentioned, three times he's mentioned first, three times she's mentioned first. Why? The equality, equal, not, not egalitarian, right? We know, we, do you understand the difference between egalitarianism and complementarianism? Egalitarianism is where you believe that men and women are equal. We're not equal, are we? We're created very differently. But we are to complement one another. The differences that are found in me complement my wife, Gail. The differences that are found in her complement me. That's what complementarianism is meant to do. Egalitarianism says that we're created equal, and therefore we can share equal responsibilities, equal rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we are equal in our rights, but we are very different in the job description or the responsibilities that we have before God. Isn't that correct? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> what is a birthing person? <laughs> What's a birthing person? It's got to be a woman, right? Only a woman can give birth. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's crazy today, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hank Gompers. Good morning. It's, it's so good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Marriage. I highly recommend it. It's wonderful. A man is incomplete until he takes a wife. He needs to be complimented. And then once he takes a wife, he's finished. <laughs> no, no, really. Yeah, but it's unfortunate what's happening with marriage today, isn't it? Why? Well, because we're not doing it according to the book. If you do it according to the book, you'll have no problem at all. But when you try to do it your way, your love is insufficient. Your commitment, your devotion, your love, it just won't hold up, will it? No. We need God's love working through us. And therefore, our love will be a faithful love, a loyal love, a life-giving love that we impart one to another. Amen? And we are all brides, aren't we? And who's our bridegroom? The Lord Jesus Christ. He used marriage to represent the relationship that we would have with our bridegroom, with our Jesus, who is so faithful, even when we are faithless. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. Once you have Jesus dwelling within you, hmm, through the person of the Holy Spirit, then you are his now and forever, never to leave you nor forsake you. You may act like a lost person sometimes, but he'll bring you back, won't he? Yeah, he keeps you, and John has described for us that word keep means to keep free from escaping. Isn't it wonderful that we can't escape his love? Hmm? He loves you more than you love him. Isn't that true? And he wants you with him in heaven. He wants you in his kingdom more than you want to be there. Do you believe that? Yeah, I surely do. Hmm. So we're going through John's gospel right now, and we're in chapter, finishing up chapter 18, the last couple of verses, and going into chapter 19. Jesus has been arrested. He's gone through the religious trials. How many religious trials were there? Three. Three. Who were they by? Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin. Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. And now we're going through the three civil trials, or legal trials, that Jesus went through. And who were they with? Pilate, Herod, Pilate. So there were six trials in all. Now, the only way you can piece all of that together is by looking at all of the gospel accounts, the three synoptics and then John's gospel, and then you can piece all of that together. Last time we were together, we said there were seven personalities, seven individuals who proclaimed the innocence, the righteousness, blamelessness, without spot, without blemish of Jesus Christ. You remember that? Who are some of those folks? Who? Claudia. Who's Claudia? Pilate's wife. How many times did she declare the innocence of Christ? Once. How about Pilate? Do you know how many times Pilate declared Christ being innocent? Six times. You go through the gospel accounts, and there's no less than six times that Pilate said, I find no fault in the man. That sacrifice of God, the Lamb of God, without spot, without blemish. 
So we looked at those personalities last time, and we ended with Pilate's wife. What was her name? Claudia Procula. Claudia Procula. Did you do any additional research about her? Most people don't know who she is at all, but we discovered that last week, didn't we? Anybody do some more research on Claudia? No? I think she's a very interesting individual to study. What did we find out about Claudia, Pilate's wife, last week? She not only sent a message to Pilate while he was sitting in the judgment seat, to have nothing, nothing to do with this innocent man, for I suffered many things because of him in a dream this past night. What else did we find out about her? She was a proselyte. She converted to Judaism. And so if you were going to convert to Judaism, whether it was an ancient Hebraism or Judaism in Jesus' day, the hope and the promise that every Jew had and even a proselyte had was what? Messiah. The coming of the Messiah, the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, the King of Israel. He would come and rescue Israel. And what did she hear for the last three years? What was the buzz in all of Jerusalem in those last half a dozen days during the Passover festival at this time? Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah has come, the Mashiach Nagid, right? And so she was thrilled about that. And I think she probably had some discussion with her husband about Jesus of Nazareth. But then we see that God had given her a dream, an understanding of the innocence, the blamelessness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, who would be the Lamb of God, the Pesach of God, to take away the sins of the world. And she was embracing that in all of her heart. So she sent her husband that note, risking it. It's a very courageous thing for her to do, a very brave thing for her to do. It was against all protocol for her to do that while he was sitting in the judgment seat trying to make a judgment of Jesus. But could you identify with Claudia last week? Who was Claudia's mother? Who? Julia, thank you. Julia. And, and who was Julia married to? Tiberius. Tiberius, who was the son of Augustus. Tiberius would become an emperor. Augustus was an emperor. But he was, she was married at the time to Tiberius. And what was the problem with their relationship? She was very promiscuous. She was a very promiscuous woman, much like the society we live in today. Even the organized church is more like a Julia than it is a Priscilla. And as a result of her promiscuity, Tiberius wasn't certain whether Claudia was his daughter or not. And so he banished her, exiled her. She would not be seen again. But Claudia, growing up, was a virtuous girl. Something admirable about her. So after Julia died, what happened? She was adopted. You, you, can you relate to any of this? Mm -hmm. We are the Horiathesia. What does that mean? The adopted adult children of who? Of God. Hmm. God. We were of our father, the devil, previously, as sons of Adam. But now we're of our father, God, as the sons of Christ. Right? And so he adopted her, gave her his name and arranged this marriage with Pilate. And there's some belief, some historical evidence to back up the fact that Claudia became a follower of Jesus Christ. And where she mentioned afterwards? Second Timothy, when Paul is making his swan song. He knows he's going to be departing this world. Is that a comforting thought for you, departing this world? Oh, yeah. A couple of people I know this week had departed this world. One just uh, last evening. But they were ready. Yes. They were in the ark, in Jesus, that way of salvation. Does religion save you? No. Going to church save you? Going to church make you a Christian? No. Going to McDonald's make you a hamburger? Hanging around the garage make you a car? No. What makes you a Christian? <laughs> By being in Jesus. Not being a fan of Jesus, not admiring Jesus, not having some uh, cognitive, intellectual, theological understanding of Jesus. What makes you a Christian is that 
your life is found in Jesus, and Jesus' life is found in you. The United States is one of the most religious nations on the face of the earth. More people in the United States than any other nation of the world says that their religion or their religious beliefs is very, very important to them. Yet, would you classify the United States as being a Christian nation? No, no, not by any moral measurable statistic. You see, religion won't save you. Having knowledge of Jesus won't save you. Having a personal relationship with Jesus is what saves. John would say, Jesus would say, and John would record for us in the 11th chapter, the 26th verse, that those who live in and believe in. See, those are the qualifiers. You've got to live in and believe in Jesus, and you'll have the gift of eternal life. And you'll know that when you depart from here, you know where you're going. There's no fear in death, is there? Death is not our foe. Death is our friend. It's the only way we can get there now, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. Very, very important to me that you all understand this. Because we are surrounded by a lot of religious people who aren't saved. They're not spiritual. They're not born again or born from above. Their appetites, their behaviors, their desires are no different than their unsaved friends and family. It should not be. There should be something very different about our lives. Claudia Peculia was very peculiar, wasn't she? Yeah. There was something very different about her life. We were outcasts too. Orphaned. Children without a father. And then Jesus, Jesus put his attention upon us, and he gave us the grace gift of faith to believe. You see, you don't choose Jesus. Jesus chooses you. You understand that, don't you? You don't save yourself. If it was up to you, then salvation would be of works and not of God. But by grace, you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, least any man should boast, but a gift from God. What was the gift? The gift is the faith to believe. The grace gift of faith is given to those who would believe. And so that's what's required, that you receive that charismata, that grace gift of the faith to believe that Jesus is all who he said he was. Now, last week we looked, and Annas, did he believe? No. 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 Annas was the godfather the uh, whole criminal cartel, wasn't he? Yeah. How many of the family of Annas bought their way into the priesthood? We call that simony. How many of the family of Annas bought their way into the priesthood? Yeah, seven. Five sons, one grandson, one son-in-law. Who was the son-in-law at this time that was high priest? Caiaphas. Caiaphas. Caiaphas believe? No. He said it's more expedient, more efficacious for one man to die on behalf of the whole nation. Right? No, he really didn't understand that the spirit of prophecy was speaking through him at that time that Jesus would be that one man who would die for the nation, for Israel. Amazing. The Sanhedrin, were they saved? No, there's a couple of them. Who were a couple of members of the Sanhedrin that were followers of Jesus, but secretly? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Are you a secret disciple? Or does everyone, truly, now listen to me, not here, because it's easy to be Christian here. It's easy for everybody to know we love and follow Jesus here, isn't it? How about when you're out there? How about when you're with your family and friends? How about when you're with your coworkers, your circle of friends that you enjoy? Do they really know that you're a follower of Jesus? Well, there were two in the Sanhedrin that came out eventually as followers. But you want everyone to know that you know that you're saved that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and that everything that he has said. Jesus is the God of the Word, right? And how do we understand who the God of the Word is? Through the Word of God. We don't worship the Word. 
we worship the Lord of the Word. Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. All of these religious people get together with all of the political class. And they have a common foe, an enemy. Previously, they were enemies, the Sanhedrin, the materialists of the day, because they didn't believe in heaven and hell, right? They didn't believe in the hereafter. They didn't believe in eternal life. And that's why they were so sad, you see. Now they call them Sadducees. But the Pharisees, on the other hand, they believed the promises of eternal life. They believed there would be a judgment after this life is over. Hmm. But the Sadducees collaborated with their enemies, the Romans, on behalf of their common enemy, Jesus. Jesus. It's no different today, beloved. The religionists of our day get together with the political class because there's one thing they cannot tolerate. Oh, they have tolerance for every other thing but except the truth of who Jesus is and his word. Strengthen yourself, your resolve, and your constitution in your faith and belief in the Word of God because it will be tested. The church is already being persecuted to some degree. You know that the uh, Catholic Church has taken on uh, several ads throughout the country denouncing one political party because it hasn't defended religious freedom, that there have been over 70 Catholic churches violated, burned, defaced, a multitude of pro-life centers. And how many arrests in all of this? None. Not one arrest. The government has given license to the persecution of the church of Jesus Christ and those who would be pro-life. Pro-marriage between one biological man, one biological woman. Would that include you? I mean, it should. And therefore, you need to be prepared. And how do we prepare ourselves? By strengthening ourselves in the Lord. That's where Claudia got her strength. To be so bold with her husband. That's where Nicodemus got his strength. One of the most revered, richest men in Jerusalem gave up everything to be a follower of Jesus. And you know that at the very end, Nicodemus lost everything, his reputation, his wealth, and eventually they killed him. They murdered him because he was a follower of Jesus. But what was Nicodemus' reward? Out of this world. <laughs> and it was eternal, right? Yeah. Well, let's pick it up where we left off last time. We're in John chapter 18. And I'm so glad you're here this morning. Can we pray one more time? Lord, there is a lot for us to glean here. There's a lot that I have gleaned myself, Lord. I have first received from you that which I want to impart to these, your children. But Lord, it has to be through your enablement, through the person of your Holy Spirit. So I ask you again, Lord, what I have not, give me. What I know not, teach me. What I am not make me, Lord, not for my sake in any way, Lord, but for your glory, for the beauty, the majesty, the wonder of your word, Lord, and for the sake of these, your children, for the increase of your kingdom, for their good, and for my own good as well, Lord. Would you speak to us this morning? Would you show us uh, new things from your word? Remind us of the old, but Lord, bring forth a new Excite us in your word. Lord, you are the God of the word. But we only come to know you through the word of God. So, Lord, as we sang, we want to experience true joy. And true joy is found by being in your presence, immersed in your love, the peace, the joy that only comes from you, Lord. And we can have a poise and a confidence and a calm no matter what storm, no matter what tribulation, no matter what testing or sorrow this world would bring upon us. And Lord, I want to thank you for the miracle of longevity within marriage. For these marriages this morning that testified of, 
a length of time that they have purpose to keep that commitment in you. Marriage can only be sustained by your power, Lord. It's, it's you who holds us together. You're that third cord that's wrapped around the two, and the strong men cannot break. We thank you for that, Lord. So again, Lord, speak to us. Show us from your word wonderful things. In your holy name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. 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 So Pilate has been uh, proclaiming Jesus' innocence. He really wants to find a way, a loophole, to let him go, but he's being pressured. Pilate's not in control of the situation, although the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, the high priest, might think they're in control. We know who's ultimately in control of this situation and every detail of it. Who's that? Jesus, And we're going to see how often Jesus fulfills the word of God because he is the God of the word. And as Pilate is standing there, he's questioning Jesus once again. And Jesus responds in verse 37, and he says, You say rightly, I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate responded... Yeah, most everybody knows how Pilate responded to that. What is truth? Was he seeing this in, saying this in sincerity, in honesty? No, he was being sarcastic about it all, wasn't he? Why? Because he lived in such a corrupt society and under a, such a corrupt government. He knew he was hanging by an edge just keeping his job as the governor of the area of Judea. Pilate, I mean, uh, Caesar was a madman. And we look at our society today and we look at all of the ways in which we have been betrayed and the ways in which we have been lied to, lies one after another after another to try to accomplish whatever their agenda might be, the elitist desire for global domination. But it's not the elitist at all, really. Who's behind all of this? Who's the chief conspirator? Hasatan, Satan himself, right. He's the one who desires to master the globe and to control everyone in it. So Pilate sarcastically said, what is truth? And if we didn't know the truth from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, we, we would say the same thing sarcastically. What is truth? Who can you believe anymore? You know. In California this week, a fourth grader was arrested. They called the principal of the school, called the police and had him arrested and taken out of the school. You know why? He didn't have a mask on. A fourth grader. Is, are we insane? Yes. Yes. Romans 1 being accomplished in our day, where God gave them over to a sec sexual revolution, then God gave them over to a homosexual revolution, and then, and then God gave them over to a reprobate mind where they can't even think straight any longer. Isn't that precisely where we are? Who, who are the two nations engaging in a, a heavy-duty military exercise this week like never before? Who, who? You reading the news? China and Russia. China and Russia. Isn't that interesting? It's amazing. Yeah, but we're worried about the climate. Well, <laughs> the biggest threat in the world today is global warming. Yeah. How insane. <laughs> <laughs> What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews, and he said to them, I find no fault in the man at all. He's innocent. He's blameless, right? So Pilate said, and what, what feast was this now? Feast of the Passover. Well, we're going to have a feast, a celebration. Did we mention that? Did he mention that in the announcements on the 25th of September? What are we going to have? Yom Torah, the Feast of Trumpets. Well, now, why are we going to be celebrating the Feast of Trumpets? Because for the first time, we're going to have a feast. We're all going to gather together, and we're going to have a great celebration. We're going to make a mess of the backyard, and we're not going to have to clean up because we're <laughs> going to go up. Who knows? The Feast of Trumpets begins on sundown, the 25th of September, ends on sundown, the 26th, all right? The two-day feast, or the 27th, the two-day feast. So if we leave here and depart here, say, oh, 11.30, <laughs> Lord willing, that morning, what time will it be in Israel? 
evening. It'll be sundown. It'll begin the uh, Feast of Trumpets. So there, there probably, there, there's a likely, there, it could possibly happen that conceivably we'll gather together, we'll have a great time, and eat as much as you want because it won't be any problem for him to lift you up. <laughs> and we won't have to clean up. Won't that be a glorious thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find no fault in him at all, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the time of the Passover. Now, this was the Passover celebration. How long did the Passover last? It was actually a seven-day feast, but only one day was technically the Passover. What day was that? The 14th day of the Jewish month? Nazan, Nazan, right? That was the actual Passover. Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. Behold, the Passover was John was baptizing there at the Jordan, John the Baptist. He said, behold, the Pesach, the Passover of God. Paul would reiterate later to the Corinthians, Christ, our Passover has come. And here, these religious folk, highly religious folks, have no idea who Jesus really is. That's true today, beloved. We have a lot of highly religious people in the United States who have really no idea of who Jesus really is. On the Feast of Passover, it was the custom of the Romans to release a prisoner to them, to show a graciousness. Do you therefore want me to release to you, and how did Pilate refer to him? The king of the Jews. Over and over and over again, Pilate will call him the king of the Jews. Without understanding that the Spirit of God is actually working through this goyim, this unsaved Gentile, and declaring the true identity of who Jesus is. When the Sadducees brought him to Pilate, he said, well, what accusation do you bring against him? What were the three accusations? Three accusations against Jesus. One, he incites the nation to insurrection. Was that true? No. When asked the question, Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? What did he say? Sure. sure. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's, right? And we, we said on the denarii was the image of who? Caesar. So give Caesar what is his. Where do we find the image of God? Hopefully in your life and mine. In your life and mine, stamp the image of God. When we become believers, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And therefore, we bear the image of God. Therefore, render unto God what is God's Caesar. What is, so what should we render unto God? I beseech you, brethren, I beg you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice unto God, holy, acceptable, which is well-pleasing, which is a reasonable act of worship. If you look at the text correctly. He offered his life for you, and now in exchange, he's asking you to offer your life for him. For him. Should I release you, the king of the Jews? Then they all cried. Ooh, all cried. How persuasive the religious leaders were, the Sadducees, the priests, the high priests, in convincing all of the people that they need not ask not for Jesus, who was an innocent man, but ask instead for who? Barabbas. Jesus was uh, Jesus bar Joseph. What does that mean? Bar Joseph. Son of Joseph. Jesus bar Joseph. What is bar? What is Abba? What is Barabbas? Bar Abba. Son of the Father. Isn't that interesting? His name means, Barabbas means son of the father. Oh, he's son of the father. Who's his father? The devil. The devil. Why? Because he's a liar. And not only is a liar, he's a robber. Not only is he a liar and a robber, he's a murderer, an insurrectionist. And the people would rather have a leader of a criminal cartel than they would a righteous man. They didn't know how to vote. We're not going to go there. Okay, I'd like to, but we're not going to. They all cried out, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber, and we're told in the other Gospels that he was a thief. And not only was he a thief, he was a murderer. He was a very, very dangerous man. Pilate's responsibility was to make sure he protected and looked after the interests of Rome. Is it in Rome's interest to release Jesus or Barabbas? Jesus, Jesus of course. He felt Jesus was no threat to Rome. 
At best, he was just delusional. He was psychotic. I mean, the man was out of his mind. He's a king, but not, a kingdom not of this world. And, and Pilate couldn't understand that at all. We understand that, don't we? Yeah. You long for a place you've never seen, a city that you belong to, whose builder and maker is. And one day soon, you're going to jump off of this place. You believe that? You're a Looney Tune too, aren't you? <laughs> but we know that it's true, even though we've never seen it, right? Never experienced it. And so Pilate took Jesus. Now we're in chapter 19 in verse 1. Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. And they put him in a purple robe. And then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. They're mocking him. What, what, what was the sign, this crown of thorns on his head? Why would they put a crown of thorns upon his head? They're crowning him king? But they didn't think he was any king at all. Purple represents royalty, but, but they didn't see him as a king. They're mocking him, mocking what is true, that he is king of the Jews, king of the world, king of the universe. But why the crown of thorns? What does the thorns represent? Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3. You see, he is the God of the word, and this is the word of God. And, and there's nothing that he does that isn't found to me, have meaning and significance in the word of God because he is the God of the word. It, it's not true, all that is in the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22. It's all true, not because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible because it is true. You understand the difference? We don't worship the word, we worship the Lord of the word, and everything he has put in here is true. Why? Because it's his truth, it's his revelation to us. It's the enlightenment that he wants to bring us with regard to our relationship to him, and most importantly, one to another. That's what we really have messed up today, don't we? Technologically, we've conquered our world. God's given us the ability to do that through our intellect. We still can't get along, can we? The United States is the most, one of the most religious countries in the world. In the Republican Party, the Republican Party would be completely irrelevant, have no real veto power in elections if it weren't for one group of people within the Republican Party. Who's that? The Evangelical Church, white evangelicals. Hmm? Now, in the Democratic Party, very religious people we are, in the Democratic Party, there's a group of people that have tremendous influence. So they have veto power, and who might that be? The black church of America. Very religious. Love the Lord. Will easily profess their faith in Christ. Yet both are so hoodwinked, so deceived, in embracing political power rather than true spiritual fruit, which brings such power and self-control, such beauty, such order. Isn't that amazing? These two groups of people, evangelical white Christians and black African American Christians, embracing what they say the same truth, essentially, but interpreting it in such different ways. So who has beguiled them? Yeah, their own ambition. And then the enemy uses it against them. You understand all of this? Am I making sense to you? I've been warning you about being very careful not to get swept up into a patriotic, patriotic movement that is America first, but has nothing to do with his kingdom, but has everything to do with that kingdom, that empire. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus said. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Is this kingdom of democratic class? Is this kingdom of the Republican class? Is this, is this kingdom involved in politics at all? No. It's not, beloved. That's the Holy Spirit to show you, to give you a balanced understanding. Where did I say to go? Genesis 3? Yes. So the Lord God, verse 14, said to the serpent, because you have done this, what did he do? He beguiled the woman. He lied about the word of God. Hath God really said? And that's basically what the lie continues to be to this day. Hath God really said? 
Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all of the cattle, more than every beast of the field, and on your belly you shall go. You shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Her seed? What's the largest cell in a man's body? A sperm cell. What's the largest cell in a woman's body? An egg. A woman doesn't have a seed. Man has the seed. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Hmm? I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, between the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman, between Satan and his offspring and Jesus and his offspring. But we know, what is it speaking of here? The virgin birth. The virgin birth, because he is the seed of God. Not any man, isn't he? No. He shall bruise your heel, your head, excuse me, and you shall bruise his heel. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will multiply, greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. He shall rule over you. Now, those of you who are married and understand the uh, battle of the sexes, you know, what takes place in marriage is that, that by nature, a man's ego, uh, <clears throat> it's a nasty thing, isn't it? It can be a monster. But my nature, a woman's desire to control a situation can be a nasty thing too, can it? And is the writer of Hebrews, Moses, saying that, that every woman will desire her husband because she thinks he's so handsome and so strong and so smart? No. It says, your desire shall be for the, your husband, and he shall rule over you. In the Hebrew text, which he's really, what he's really saying is that her desire is to usurp your authority, your responsibility. Now, if you understand that by nature, by nature I have some real problems because of the sin nature I have. You do recognize you are a sinner by nature? Yeah. Hmm? You brought Nolan this morning, Glory? That little sinner is in my nursery? <laughs> he is, isn't he? He came into this world a little sinner. You and Brandon can only produce. Two sinners produce. I'm sorry to have to tell you that, but he's a cute little sinner. <laughs> But the purpose of, of parenting is bring them to an understanding of the fact that they are sinners and the sin separates them from God and they need to come to that place where they surrender to God. Hmm? But we recognize we're all sinners and that sin nature is something we're born with. We don't, we don't sin doesn't making, make us a sinner, does it? We sin because we are my dog barks therefore barking makes him a dog? No. He barks because Okay, the same with us. And so you need to understand that. There's a sin nature that all of us come into this world with, and, and, and because our wiring has been defective, and we've got some cross wires going on here, some cross wiring, short wiring, short circuitry going on, we act in very dysfunctional ways. But Jesus has come to straighten out all that wiring, to correct all that dysfunction to make what is natural, supernatural, right? Verse 17. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both what? Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Salad, salad, salad. <laughs> oh, man. So what did the crown of thorns represent? The curse. The curse of sin. Thorns and thistles shall grow. How do you, how do you provide yourself with everything that you need to sustain your life? You have to work. Well, it used to be in this country, if you don't work, now we got a lot of people that don't work and they eat pretty well. But that's not the way it's intended to be. You see, we're supposed to work. So this crown of thorns that Jesus was wearing, that was placed upon his head, God was using that to display to the world that the curse of sin will be placed upon the head of his son. The curse no longer has to affect us. Even that curse that he was talking about in the battle of the sexes or the genders, that can be lifted. 
where we can really experience in marital harmony the complementarianism that God intended, the love, the life-giving power of marriage, you see, what it's intended to be. But that curse can only be lifted as we're in the Savior. Amen? Go back to chapter 19 of John's Gospel. So we see that was all the way in the beginning there. Yeah, the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it upon his head, and they put a purple robe upon him, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Six times Pilate is going to declare his innocence, yet Pilate doesn't have the courage to do what is right. Hmm. Like most politicians in our day, Right? The guy in West Virginia is just happy he's going to retire in two years. He won't have to answer to the electorate for what he's done and his betrayal of his own state and the citizens that he's supposed to represent. Politicians. Politics. It's a dirty, dirty, dirty business. Is your hope in a politician? Is your hope in somebody who's going to come to elected office? You, you gotta get, listen, you've got to wipe that delusion off your mind. Our, the answer to everything that ails us is not a political solution, and it's not in any particular politician. I vote my conscience. I vote on those issues that I believe are most dear to the heart of God, and that's how I vote. But my hope is not in any man politically. My hope is in the God-man, Jesus Christ, who promised that he would come and heal every wound. Correct, made right, every wrong. Isn't that going to be wonderful one day? Yeah. yeah. I find no fault in him. And then Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns, a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, another quote of Pilate that's pretty famous. What did he say? Ecce homo. Ecce homo. Behold the man. Again. Again, under God's influence, with him not knowing it, what he was proclaiming was, Behold, the man who would take away the sins of the world. Through one man, sin entered the world, and the curse that followed. But through the second Adam, through another man, the curse will be lifted. At Jehomo, behold, the man. Verse 6, therefore, when the chief priests, the officers, saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, verse 7, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. He wasn't an insurrectionist. He said, Pay your taxes to Caesar. What else did they accuse him of? That's the actual sin he committed. But it was no sin because he was telling the truth. He wasn't lying. He was the son of God. That is the truth. But they accused him of blasphemy, not believing he's the son of God. What did the Romans and Greeks think when they hear that title, son of God? What would Pilate be thinking? He grew up in a, a Greco-Roman culture in all of that mysticism and that religious belief. Well, what would they think? What would these Goyim think when they hear those phrases, son of God? Idol, little gods, okay. Mythical gods. They believed that the mythical gods did produce children, sons, daughters, and that they would dwell among men. And sometimes they would come among men for purposes of judgment. Other times they would come among men for purposes of blessing. But it was all under the will of the gods. So think about that for a moment. We'll get back to that. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. There's a phobia that came upon him. His wife hasn't passed him that note yet. When he goes on to the judgment seat, that's when she passes him the note saying, I've had a dream, a very disturbing dream about this innocent man, have nothing to do with him. But here, this phobia, this fear enters him, this anxiety. Why? 
when they claim that he claimed himself to be the son of God. He's already previously interrogated him, and he said, yes, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Wait a minute. You're from outside of this world? Outside of this material universe? You are one of the sons of the gods? Has he come to curse me? To judge me, Pilate might be thinking? Wow. Now, this is why fear came upon him. This is his concern. More people in the world believe in aliens and UFOs than they believe in God any longer. Did you know that? There's a lot of buzz about UFOs today, isn't there? Alien abductions and encounters. And be careful. It's going to be one of the great lies, the great deception that's going to fall upon the world. That'll be aliens that gave you all of the scientific uh, knowledge, understanding, advances so that you could advance the society. It wasn't God at all. God was just a crutch to help you because you're so weak emotionally and psychologically. But it's these aliens. More interest in aliens and UFOs now than there is the God of the Bible. But it's a great deception. When an abduction starts, I don't know you, if you have, have you read much about alien abductions and people that have experienced these abductions? No? When, when an abduction starts, there's only one way to stop it. And, and many people have given testimony to this. You know the one way to stop an abduction? Proclaim the name of cry out to Jesus. Jesus, help. That's what I'm going to say. Jesus, help. Stops immediately. Why would that be? Because it's spiritual. It's not physical. It's not material. And even Satan himself would disguise himself as what? An angel of light. And it's an interesting. All of these UFO sightings are lights. Hmm. Be careful. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went out again into the praetorium, and he said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Why was that? Fulfilling prophecy once again, go to Isaiah 53. He's the God of the word, fulfilling the word of God. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah is a forbidden chapter in the Bible. Forbidden to whom? The Jews. The Jews forbid other Jews from reading Isaiah 53. Why? It so exactly, so succinctly describes the person of Jesus Christ. When the Philip came upon the eunuch from Ethiopia who had purchased the scroll of Isaiah, and he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, and Philip goes into the chariot because God had told him to engage this Ethiopian eunuch because God purposed to touch his life for an eternity. And the Ethiopian eunuch says to Philip, let me ask you. Well, first of all, Philip, as he's running along the chariot, he says to the Ethiopian eunuch, he says, do you know what you're knowing again? Or do you really understand what you're reading, basically, is what he's saying. And he says, how, how, how can I know unless someone helped me understand? Boop, he pops into the chariot. And then what does the Ethiopian eunuch say to him? You don't know? Yeah, yeah. Who, who, who's, the, who's the prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he speaking of another? And who is Isaiah 53 speaking of? Jesus. And Philip begins at that point to explain the mission of the Messiah of Israel. And that Ethiopian eunuch says, what would forbid me from being baptized? Wow. Jesus went out of his way to bring a dream to Claudia. Jesus goes out of his way to touch the Ethiopian. What did Jesus have to do to touch your life? What extent did he go to to make sure your eyes were open, your mind, your heart, to the truth? Isn't that wonderful? 
Mm. So Isaiah 53 is speaking about the Savior, about Jesus Christ. There's no other man. And, and Philip was right in his interpretation of the text as the, Philip, uh, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch was asking. And that's why it's such a forbidden book today because when the Jews look at this, there's only one man that has fulfilled what is described here, and that is Jesus. Now, speaking of the fact that he was silent before Pilate, look what Isaiah 53 says. Let's pick it up... Uh, Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, taking upon himself the judgment, the wrath of God for our behalf. What Barabbas deserved, Jesus took upon himself. Whether Barabbas ever understood that or not, who, who knows? Only God knows. You know. But who's Barabbas? We are. Jesus took upon himself the judgment that we deserved. But he was wounded, verse 5, for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. For the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The crown of thorns representing the curse. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Was Jesus giving a self-fulfilled prophecy or was Jesus fulfilling prophecy? He was fulfilling prophecy because he is the God of the word. And he lives according to the word of God. Back to the text. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Pilate was a pretty weak man at this point. He was being manipulated by a number of people. But he was being manipulated more by the Sanhedrin and his concern over the loss of his position and anything else. Did justice and righteousness mean anything to him at this point? It would have been far more beneficial for him to release Jesus for the sake of Rome than it was Barabbas. But why would he release Barabbas to them instead of Jesus? Because he was concerned about his own prosperity, position, future. And justice meant nothing to him. Justice died that day. Justice has died in America, hasn't it? There's a double standard, a two-tier justice system in the United States now. Make no mistake about that. Yes, I have the power to release you. Verse 11, Jesus answered, you could have no power against, at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered you to me has a greater sin. Who was that one? Was it Judas, Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, the people? Who, de who delivered him to Pilate? Yeah, all of them, all the above, you know. I, I grew up, unfortunately, in my family. Um, they were not prejudiced against any group of people but one. You know what group of people that was happened to be? The Jews. My, my family, I grew up a Roman Catholic and Italian-American, and my family hated Jews. You know why they hated Jews? They were the Christ killers. That's what they were taught. That's what the church taught them. Then it was the Jews who were the Christ killers. Who killed Christ? Was it the Jews or the Romans? Who killed Christ? We did. My sin put him on the cross. And so did yours, right? Yeah. You have no power over me except to be given to you from above. God's, God's sovereignty is what? Our sanity in these crazy times. Please remember that. God's sovereignty is our sanity when we can't make sense of what is taking place today. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Now, did they have any regard for Caesar? No, 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 no. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Here we go again, right? When Pilate therefore heard that saying, 
he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now that's when he has slipped a note from who? From Claudia, his wife. And what does the note say? Have nothing to do with this just man. I have suffered many things in a dream this night because of him. And I ask you to go home and think about what things she may have suffered and what things have you suffered because of Jesus. Anybody think about that or did you just go about your business again? Anybody wonder, meditate? You know, it's good for you to muse. You know what the difference between being amused and muse? Amused is you don't think, you're just entertained. Now, I admit and confess that after a long day, I like to be amused. I go down and, boom, you know, and half the time I don't even know what I'm watching or hearing. It's mindless. I'm not thinking about it, right? I like those mindless moments. Men can go into their nothing, nothing box. Ladies, you can't understand that. You don't have one of those. But we have a nothing box we can go in. <laughs> and she'll say, what are you thinking about? And I say, no. nothing. She doesn't believe that's possible. It's quite relaxing. It's a little oasis, isn't it, fellas? Yeah. That's amuse. But to be amused is to think deeply, to meditate, to consider, to give thought to. Did you? What? What, what did you come up with? Your husband's saying, shut up? <laughs> All right, wait a minute. Think before you speak. <laughs> You, Deborah? Yeah. <laughs> Y'all, but don't know me. I'm very impatient. Um, the Lord's working on that, but I'm not there. And, you know, I wounded somebody this week with a moment of, and the Lord put it right in my face when I asked him about it, and it was painful. But it needed to be dealt with. Mm. So, yeah. We love who you are, Deborah. Yeah. Glenn, you want to say something? Your life. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think what Claudia suffered more than anything else is looking into her own life in comparison to this innocent savior of the world. This blameless, spotless, blemish-free lamb of God who took away my sins. The, 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 listen, I don't read the Bible. The Bible reads me. I don't read the Bible. The Bible reads me. And it tells me more about myself than I want to know. Is that not true? And, and the, the greater distress that I experience when I read the scriptures is because of what I am. Not because of what I do. I, I do what I do because of what I am, you see. And, and therefore, I come to him. I submit myself to him, right? By the mercies of God, I beg you, I beseech you, I implore you, by the mercies of God, present yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, well-pleasing. Why? I need change. Do you? Yes. Yeah. We all do. But the only way that the real change is going to occur from the inside out, at the core of who you are, is when you surrender and yield to Jesus. And, and then I become everything that, that my wife needs me to be, that my son needs me to be, that you as my church need me to be. But I don't have that capacity and that ability in myself. Go ahead. Try to work it out in the flesh. See how far you get. So this is at the point. He sits in the judgment seat. His wife passes him the note. He reads the note, and now I think he's in more fear. How is it that this guy claims to be a son of God, the gods birthed him, brought him down to earth? Why? And now my wife has a dream about this man? Now you got to know, Pilate's pretty weirded out at this point. Right? Yeah. do 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 so from that point on, he's purposed to release him. Verse 14 now. Now it was the preparation day for the Passover, about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. What's the sixth hour? If you're a Roman, it's one time. If you're a Jew, it's another time. As if you're a Roman, what's the sixth hour? 6 a.m. If you're a Jew, it's noon. So what time do you think it is? Yeah, I, I, I vote for noon. There's some debate about it, but I think it's noon. 6 a.m. or 6 hour uh, with the Jewish reckoning. So it's about noon. He's on the judgment seat. 
It's the preparation day for the Passover. No way, but the Passover is only one day. It's the 14th day of Nisan. What's this preparation day? Because the Passover as a whole is a whole week of a festival, right? It's seven days. And so we're talking about the preparation day for the whole week. <laughs> Passover would include the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of First Fruits. And if you know something about the Jesus that we love and serve, he fulfilled all of the feast days of Israel. The first four feast days of Israel were fulfilled on the very day. What's the first one? Passover. He was crucified. 14th day of Nazan. What's the second one? The Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th day of the Jewish month of Nazan. What did that represent? The sins of the world being removed now. Eleven. All eleven is removed. Then on the day immediately following the normal Saturday Sabbath after Passover was called the Feast of... And on the year in which Jesus was crucified, what day was that? The 17th day of Nazan. It was a Sunday morning. And what happened? He rose from the dead, the first fruits of God. That's what Paul would refer to him as. That Jesus Christ, our first fruits, is risen from the dead. And then, and then after the feast, 50 days later, there was another feast. And what did they call that? Pentecost. 50, meaning 50. What happened on Pentecost? The church was birthed. Luke, the only Gentile writer of the Bible, records in the book of Acts, when Pentecost had fully come, or when Pentecost was fulfilled, the church was birthed. Now think about that. Jesus. It was the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. They're all one, aren't they? You don't embrace modalism, do you? Like T.D. Jakes, Touchdown Jakes, you know? <laughs> Heretic? Hmm? God manifests himself in three forms, not three persons, not individually separate. They're all one, aren't they? The Holy Spirit God? Jesus God? The Father God? Yes. Yes. And so God purposed that he would fulfill all four feasts on the very day. What do we have left? Three, Three fall feasts. In which month? Month of Tishri. Which are they? You should know this, beloved. You're going to get a test when you get to heaven. You want to pass the test, don't you? The month of Tishri, the first one coming up is? Trumpets. Associated with another, another celebration that the Jews celebrate currently, which is called? Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. Jewish New Year, Feast of Trumpets, same day. Except the Feast of Trumpets, two-day feast, right? And what is believed is going to take place on the Feast of Trumpets? You ready? Rapture practice, you ready? <laughs> <laughs> the very next feast, after the Feast of Trumpets in the month of Tishri, is in the fall of the year, is what? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, who does that affect? The Jews. Jesus wasn't stoned to death. Why? He couldn't be stoned. Not a bone of his body would be broken, right? But it said that he was pierced. And the Jews, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Zechariah prophesied, and they will mourn. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says, says they will look upon the pierced one with such deep regret and sorrow. Yom Kippur is the day that Zechariah will be fulfilled. That feast will be fulfilled by Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And, and all of Israel's eyes will be, all of Israel will be saved. Not every Jew, but the national rejection of Jesus as the Messiah will be over. And the na national acceptance of Christ as their Savior, the Messiah of Israel, will be accepted. The spirit of grace and supplication will fall upon the Jew, and they will be saved. For by grace, they will be saved by faith. Not of works. We said, even should boast, right? God will give them the grace gift of faith to believe and open up their eyes. Wow. Feast of Trumpets, Yom Terah, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. What's the next feast? Tabernacles. Tabernacles. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means? That God, that God would actually come down and tabernacle with us, live among us. Did he do that? He did that the first time, didn't he? Mary had a little lamb. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. The son of God. The babe of Mary. Right? Tabernacle with us. But then he had to leave us. 
But is he coming again? And, and I, I believe that Jesus is going to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles, that the actual second coming when Jesus steps foot on planet Earth will be the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles. And once again, Emmanuel, God tabernacling with us. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? Huh? Yeah. Verse 15, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? Hmm. The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> what hypocrites. <laughs> How did they feel about Caesar? They hated Caesar. They hated the, the occupation of their land by the Romans. They wanted to overthrow the Romans, that the Messiah would definitely come and help them overthrow the Romans. So they're being so hypocritical at this point. But what they're doing is manipulating Pilate. For if Pilate says he's a friend of Jesus, he wants to lead, let Jesus go, then Jesus is an enemy of Caesar, proclaiming to be king. For we have no king but Caesar. And then he delivered them him to them to be crucified and so they took Jesus and led him away and he bearing his cross went out to the place called the place of the skull which is called in Hebrew Golgotha hmm. I think we better stop here because I wanted to go to the Akada. what's the Akada? The binding of Isaac. There's tremendous symbolism that Jesus fulfills in the Akadah, in the binding of Isaac, which is found where? Genesis chapter 22. So that's your homework assignment. You're going to go back and you're going to read Genesis 22. That's called the Akadah. Why is it the Akadah? Because from a Jewish perspective, they're emphasizing the willingness of Isaac to offer himself. Not the sacrifice of Abraham, but the willingness of Isaac. Now, now, we, the Gentile church in the West, we emphasize the giving of the son by Abraham. But the Jews emphasize the willingness and the surrender of the son to the father. Both perspectives are good, but I think the second one has more value. So you ask yourself, why did Jesus have to carry his cross? Because in symbolism, in type and sign, Isaac carried the wood up the mountain to Moriah. Jesus is the fulfillment, the realization of everything that the Old Testament promised with regard to the Messiah. Oh, it's so full of meaning. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. Genesis 22, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Do you understand these things? Do you see the, the, the harmony that exists, the continuity between the Old Testament and the New? So many contemporary churches today and pastors will say, forget about the Old Testament, forget about Israel, don't talk about Bible prophecy, and then you're, you're stole from you. You're robbed of all of the tremendous meaning that the scriptures bring about. So next week. The Akadah, Genesis 22. We'll pick it up where we left off. Shall we stand? Pastor David?